Hello and welcome to Miniature Adventures. I'm Big Lee and this week I want to talk about time tourism. So this weekend the wife and I are heading away for yet another long weekend, this time visiting locations in and around Oxford. Despite having been to hundreds of museums, big and small, over the years, there are still plenty that we haven't been to and we are determined to rectify this if we can. Blenheim Palace is the main focus of this particular trip and amazingly I've never been there before so I'm looking forward to visiting it and the nearby Soldiers of Oxfordshire Museum. Many such weekend trips will be organised as the year goes by and it begs the question, are we indulging in what could be described as time tourism or perhaps more accurately given my interest in military history, conflict tourism? I'm also a bit of a sci-fi geek and this brings to mind temporal tourism from Doctor Who. Um, in it, time tourists travel to famous events in history, usually facilitated by companies like Nostalgia Tours or Jolly Chronola Days and Yesterways Limited. But as my wife and I have discovered, why book through these fictional companies when all you need is a suitable destination and a nearby travel or driver hotel? And perhaps more importantly, what do these little adventures have to do with wargaming. So I'm just about old enough to remember that back in the 1980s writer and journalist Patrick O'Rourke coined the phrase war tourism to describe war correspondence but it could just as easily be used to describe thrill seekers visiting active war zones. Personally I'd rather wait till all the bullets or arrows have stopped flying and historians have done their work trying to figure out what the hell actually happened. And for me, that is the key to my sort of conflict tourism. I'm going to experience the history, the museums and the landscapes of military history. And in so doing, I'm trying to get a clearer understanding of a particular conflict, campaign or battle. I'm looking for a different perspective that maybe can't be communicated effectively through the pages of a book or via a documentary. Now, some time back I had discussed why I like doing battlefield tours and I'll put a link in the video somewhere up here. Uh, war games occupy, in my opinion, a unique position. It's part historian, part military enthusiast and much of our research is found in books, archive documents and of course photos. But walking a battlefield can give an entirely new perspective on a landscape that cannot be conveyed in a combat diary or a history book. And I think the same can be true of some of the best examples in museums, especially if they have a link to a particular regiment, battle or period of history. But being an avowed miniature adventurer means I am not just absorbed by research, miniatures and museums, but also the landscape and the architecture of history. Immersing yourself in that sort of historical culture, whether that is on the battlefield site or in a museum, is a great way to shake off the library dust and stack grass and truly breathe in a period. You'd be surprised what you can learn when you step away from the games table and see the bigger picture. So of course I'm now going to ask, are you also a time tourist? Do you have a favourite museum, building or battlefield? And how did it inspire your wargaming? As always, I'd love to hear what you think in the comments below. So time for a hobby update. It's been a busy week actually. Last weekend, uh, myself and several members of the Rejects went down to Tunbridge and the Cavalier War Game Show. This is usually our first show of the year and a great way to lift our spirits in the cold and gloomy winter months. I picked up Ray and Stuart and we met Steve, Dan and Richard at the show in what turned out to be a great day of games and conversation. Now this isn't a big show so we normally hang around until about 2pm at the latest but this time we didn't get away until half past three, nearly four o'clock I think it was, uh, simply because we'd spent so much time chatting. It was great to meet up with you know, friends old and new, um, Bob Caldry, Henry Hyde, Mike Sace and many 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 others. I've talked so much I actually had a sore throat by the end of the day and that's saying something coming from me. There was an interesting if small selection of traders, although the absence of Colonel Bills did leave a noticeable hole in the, the lineup. Uh, that being said, it was still possible to buy you know, modelling, painting supplies you needed from these traders that were there and several commented that they'd had a very good day's trading, which is always really good to hear. Personally, I didn't spend a great deal picking up a, uh, just a few bits and paints, um, pots and resin pieces from uh, Debris of War, a couple of NDF buildings from Blots, uh, and a book from Dave Lanchester. Actually, let's phrase that slightly. I didn't buy uh, paint as much. Instead, I, I picked up a few bottles of Vallejo Express paints um, just because I want to give them a try out. I, I've 
heard lots about them but I haven't used any yet so I just want to compare them to my existing games or contra games or actually, or contrast paints um, I, you know, I much prefer dropper bottles um, let's just say that um, open pots and me don't mix now I'm not planning on doing a review as such uh, there are plenty of excellent reviews online to choose from but this is purely a personal exploration of the options to see if I can switch over to something and dropper bottles now I quite enjoyed the range of games on display and there were some really nice looking demos to uh, oogle over. Um, several stood out including the Pegasus Bridge game by Retired Wargamers Reloaded and the 1100th Modern Ein Buchen Welt by uh, Middleton Hundreds but I also greatly enjoyed the 10mm Peninsula campaign game uh, by the Confederacy of Eastbourne Wargamers and of course Tunbridge Wells Wargame Society's A Blood on the Lotus Garden their 28mm Samurai Skirmish game was really nice to look at as usual I shot way too many pictures clocking up in excess of two images which for such a modest size show is slightly bonkers. I also shot a lot of film and my Cavalier video was released early in the week and for anyone that wants to see what this great show was about please check it out. It seems to have gone down really well, been very popular. Then on Monday evening, still recovering from Cavalier, instead of our usual paint and chat session on Zoom, some of the rejects gathered for a refight of the Lake Tresamine battle run by Jonathan Freitag. Last week's game had Ray and I as the Carthaginians, uh, and a more complete victory would be hard to imagine. We were lucky with the order of activations, and that luck extended to our dice in LA, while the Roman dice were, well awful. The, this week we swapped sides, giving Richard and Steve a chance for revenge. Ray took command of the head of the Roman column in a narrow defile leading away from the lakeshore, while I commanded Flaminius and the other half of the army with our backs to the water. Now initially the game seemed to go our way, with Ray doing well to hold off a Carthaginian attack in the defile, and my troops were able to get off the lakeshore and form into a nice solid line. But having organised ourselves effectively, attacking was an entirely other prospect. Ray managed to fight his way out of the defile, but at a cost, and my line of heavy infantry was ground down, first by a wave of hairy kilts and then by Spanish Gutari. Richard's dice were much better in this game and he, he was able to bring forward Hannibal and his heavy spearmen so that when I finally resorted to sending in the Triari it just wasn't enough and we were thrown back. The loss of the veterans and the medium cavalry behind them was the last straw and the Roman army broke and was defeated. Um, when the respective points were actually uh, compared, it was actually closer than I'd thought, but close is not good enough in this game, and the Carthaginian commanders had achieved a well-earned victory. So now for a workbench update. Um, now that we're into the last few weeks of the Analog Hobbies Painting Challenge, I'm trying to focus on getting some individual projects done. As I mentioned last week, the competition includes some side bonus rounds in the form of a, a fictional library where you can move between different sections, each with their own theme. Completing a themed room not only gains you the points for the model, but also some bonus points. And as I'm not working on an army or a bigger project this year, I've been completing lots of little projects, lots of models from other armies and projects from previous years. Um, I also have some uh, paint, I've also been painting a few other figures just for fun uh, and I've managed to work my way through various rooms in the challenge library. Every time I do the, the painting challenge I remember how much I enjoy painting 28mm. Um, not that I want to build an army in it but I do enjoy painting in that scale. I'm still a 6mm wargamer at heart but I do enjoy painting larger figures um, probably stemming from all those years playing D&D &D and painting models for that. So I've been making an effort to dig down in my lead mountain and find a few neglected figures to bring out into the light. So time for a book review. This week I wanted to review Tracing Your Army Ancestors by Simon Fowler. Now I found this 2006 edition of the book in a charity shop and paid a mere one pound for it. So I consider that to be an absolute bargain, um, it, especially as it was in mint condition. It was originally published by Pen and Sword in 2006, but there is a third edition updated in 2017, which you can get from all the usual online retailers. Now I've done a bit of family history research myself when the kids were first born. I only managed to go back in the end to sort of the end of the 18th century, but it's the sort of activity that you can pick up it quite easily at any point, and no doubt I will go back to it at some point. Indeed, in the last 20 years since I last did any proper genealogical research, many of the records that I would have had to have used as on microfilm or paper records are now of course online. 
but knowing what records are available is half the battle and that's where this book comes in. Focusing specifically on army ancestors, this comprehensive little volume um, will point you in the right direction and kickstart your research. And this book should help you to find uh, the career of an individual officer or soldier or even help you to research particular battles, pointing you in the right direction of available sources. One of the things I like about this book is, it is you don't need any prior knowledge. I was, uh, you know, it's none of it's expected of the reader. There's a chapter entirely devoted, for instance, to the British Army and the history of its organisation. The book then goes on to explain which records have survived and can be found and how they can help your research, whether that is personal or online. Across its 17 chapters, the book discusses the organisation of the army in the 18th and 19th centuries, what records are available for the army before 1660. Uh, it discusses officers and other ranks, medals, casualty records and discipline and desertion records. Also looks at other important documents like pension records, but also doesn't ignore those who served in militia or indeed the women in the army of India, for instance, and other colonial locations. The book then ends with an entire chapter on the Boer War, another chapter on the First War, and then of course a chapter on the Second World War, and finally a post-war period up to 1969. The annexes at the end of the book are also really useful, starting with a short guide to understanding army service numbers. There's also a guide to problem solving, which briefly discusses issues such as identifying medals, uniforms and badges. This section also discusses records for soldiers who died on active service, such as the in the Wargraves Commission's website. And the third appendix lists the available National Archives research guides which can be downloaded, each of which focus on a particular period from 1660 onwards. And finally, Appendix 4 looks at War Office records uh, that are available on microfilm. Now, although I haven't seen the later editions of this book, I expect these appendices have been updated with new publications from the last 11 years since this book was first published. Now, I can't say I've read the book cover to cover. I only bought it a week ago. But I did dip in and read specific sections, and I found this to be quite an interesting book to flip through. Certainly, I think it will be a very useful reference work, helping me to locate period-specific records uh, when I'm going to reading up on a new period, for instance. I, like many other war gamers, have quite a few army ancestors, and this guide will definitely help me find out more about them. So that's it for this week. Please join the conversation in the comments below. I really do enjoy reading your comments and I promise to make more of an effort to respond and join me in when I can. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe and share. And if you want to keep up to date with weekly content from this channel, please tap the bell notification icon. So until next week, stay safe, keep gaming and of course, keep rolling high.